coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap, an exploit leaves Docker containers leaky. Who really owns your email account? And then it's one hash algorithm to rule them all. Then it's a great big batch of your questions, our answers, and much, much more on this week's episode of TechSnap. Hi, everyone, and welcome to TechSnap. This is episode 167 of Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems network and administration podcast. We stream this episode live on June 19th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by our three fine sponsors, Ting, DigitalOcean, and IX Systems. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as this here show goes on our live stream, why that's powered by the incredible Scale Engine over at ScaleEngine.com. You've got to go check that out. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, the admin, the tech, and the teacher, Mr. Alan Jude. Hey there, Alan. Hey, Chris, everybody. Thanks for watching. Hey, Alan. How's it going up there on the east coast of Canada? Is it as hot over there as it is today? Uh, it's like 24 Celsius, so not too hot. Yeah, but you're, you're doing warm. good, aren't you? You're doing good. Yep. Well, uh, maybe it'll heat up after we get through some of our news stories, because we got we got a big show today, turns out. Surprise, surprise, everybody. 167 of the TechSnap, finally. A big episode. <laughs> there you go. Finally. <laughs> We've never done that before. <laughs> Well, People are in for such a shock. I know. It's his first time ever. It's incredible. Uh, actually, our first story is one that is particularly uh, pertains to my interest. It is a potential leaky situation with Docker, isn't it? What's going on? Yeah. So, uh, so people have managed to find basically a virtualization escape, uh, basically the ability to break out of a Docker and access files on the host system. Is it fair to call what Docker is virtualization, though? Um, I noticed this exactly article does of, it a lot, but yeah, uh, well, it's it's a kind of virtualization. It's more like containerism, right? I mean, because it's right, but that's a type. Like if you actually look up the yeah. old-fashioned nineteen seventies definition of virtualization, yeah. it's one of the types. Okay, uh, but yeah, so it's basically a container. Uh, they actually call them Linux containers, I think, uh, and it's kind of supposed to be semi-synonymous to FreeBSD jails, but they're architected very differently, uh, and hence has this problem. Uh, but basically, what it means is that uh, if you're running an untrusted app in the Docker instance, or if you know some, if you're running someone else's Docker instance that you don't know what's going on, it can read the files off your host system, including privileged files, right? Because if you're root in the Docker, then if you break out of the Docker, you're root on the host system. And so, yeah. Uh, so a security exploit is surfaced that allow rogue programs to break out of Docker and access any file on the host OS. Uh, although it has been solved in the latest version of Docker, which is 1.0, which uses Docker Engine 0 0.12. But 0 0.11 of the Docker Engine and everything previous uh, means that they can compromise your stuff. Uh, the flaw demonstrates that any given Docker image someone is asking you to run in your Docker setup can access any file on your host, including dumping slash etc slash shadow, which is where your hashed mm. root password is stored mm -hmm. and the password for every other user. So, you know, even if you disallow SSH as root, they would get the hash of the other user. So they could, you know, break the two hashes, log in as the one user, and then sue to root, and now they have root on your box. Uh, sorry, I lost my face. Anyway, uh, as long with other sensitive information, they could get any file that's on the system, basically. Yeah, I mean, if you uh, get the they, shadow file, you're going to get Yeah, you can get ready. anything. Yeah. Uh, compromise the security of the host or any other Docker container, because once you break out into the host, then you could scan and go into all the other Dockers as well. Uh, the proof of concept uh, relies on a kernel capability that allows any process to open uh, the file on the host based on its inode number. Right. Uh, so basically, in the Docker, you can make the kernel call and look up the inode number two, which is the slash, like the root file system. Uh, with this information uh, and the kernel capability, it's possible to walk the entire file system until you find the file you're looking for and then open it explicitly by its inode number. So you can get the directory listing but not access the files, but the directory listing includes the inode number, and with the inode number, you can open a file without needing to know where it is. Now, the Docker folks say, we want to emphasize this vulnerability only applies to users who are running Docker in an engine, the Docker engine in a non-recommended way by running untrusted applications with root privileges inside containers. So, mm, yeah, but that's probably a pretty common thing people do. Well, specifically, what's the point of having a Docker if you have to trust the app? If you trust the app, you could just run it on the host. 
Yeah, I think that, I, I mean, Because right. I guess the difference is that Docker is meant only for containerization to keep things clean. And consistent. Not to actually provide any security features. Well, I would, I would bet, yes, they do want to, right? Yeah, I mean, I think they do, and I think that's why that's kind of well, not a great like argument. Well, they would like to have uh, right. security features, but they right. don't, is what they're right. saying. No, yeah, right now it seems to be more about an issue of you, of addressing user land diversity under Linux than more than it is um, yeah. security isolation. Well, in, uh, they've addressed part of the issue, and we see this is a very common mistake right here. Uh, in earlier Docker engine releases, including uh, 0.11 and everything before that, uh, we dropped a specific list of kernel capabilities uh, Include, well, of course, this list did not include the capability that was used in this exploit. Mm. And then all other kernel capabilities were available inside the Docker container. So basically, they enumerated badness. They made a list of the things you shouldn't be able to do. <laughs> this is always the wrong approach. Luckily, they have apparently fixed that. Yeah. In Docker 0.12 and all forward versions of Docker, uh, we drop all the kernel capabilities by default and have a whitelist of the ones that should be allowed instead. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, this changes our kernel capabilities from a blacklist to a whitelist, which is how it should have been done. Mm -hmm. It's probably worth underscoring that it's only a proof of concept, but I think it's one that... Uh, well, it's, it means it's, it's just... The proof of concept just shows you how you would do it. Yet. Anybody yeah. could do it to do... Yeah, it, it does everything you'd want it to do, you which know, it's, give me the root password. You know, what's funny is uh, we were just on, on last, on Sunday, we were looking at something called Cubes OS, which is um, really yep. heavy into Zen isolation. So all of the environments, your different applications are all separated into their own Zen private virtual yep. machines. Um, there was a talk about it at the Beehive Con in Tokyo that we linked to. Yeah. Uh, so if you if you want to know more about Cubes OS, there's a 45 minute presentation over at beehivecon.org. Well, and and uh, I did a I did a kind of an in depth dive on it on last on Sunday, and one of the things that I found that was particularly you know interesting is this is a great example of people asking in the chat room during last. It's like, well, why would you do this when you could just run these applications from Docker containers? Well, because right here, this is uh, a quote from the Docker people at Docker.com. Please remember that at this time we don't claim that Docker engine out of the box is suitable for containing untrusted programs with root privileges. Right. Whereas, you know, that's basically the entire point of a FreeBSD jail is to contain root in the container. And I think, uh, I think too, that people might, uh, I think people might have gotten the wrong impression basically because of jails. They, because, well, specifically, they keep hearing that Docker is like jails yeah. and it's not at yeah. all. It's it's base it's apparently it's not even a ch root because that's part of the source of this problem here, but uh, yeah, it's a it's a really good tool for uh, being able to like package something up and yeah, deliver it to it a lot of Linux around. distros yeah. and move it around and and have it run on every machine you move it to and it, and when they it, when they combine it with a Docker hub where you can upload to the Docker hub and then kind of like get to you know push it down or pull it you know check in and check out that's all very nice but the security angle of it's got to be worked on. I'm sure. Yep. I'm sure now that. Well, and people just we need to educate people that Docker is specifically disclaiming any security features, so don't expect any. And I do want to. Ch chat room is bringing up a good point. I would like to underscore is if you can, do consider taking whatever steps you need to to avoid running your applications when possible with root privileges. It's not always possible with everything. Right. Well, it depends on a couple of things, but. You know, if you want to listen on a port number under 1024, then you need to, although you can run it on a higher one and use a firewall to deal with that. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. No, I, yeah, I know, I know, yeah. Uh, but uh, the hack specific, or the uh, exploit specifically mentions some other products that are based on uh, Docker, and then it, uh, the Docker people are recommending using App Armor or uh, SE Linux, SE Linux yeah. to can, uh, further restrict the Docker. That makes the sense. interesting thing is it kind of seems like Docker would benefit from Capsicum, which is a framework for uh, capabilities where it's like you can have this capability to do this one thing and then give it up when you don't need it anymore. Right? So Docker would have the capability to do the thing it needs to start and then get rid of that capability so if it got um, compromised, it didn't have that capability anymore. Mm. Or, uh, you know, one of the examples is TCP dump. On FreeBSD, this is now has uh, Capsicum. And the point is that to open the Ethernet interface to actually capture packets requires root privileges. But you're basically analyzing people's packets. They're, 
you know, that's kind of um, the biggest target for somebody to write a malform packet that'll exploit TCP dump. So with the capsicum version of TCP dump, that's the default in FreeBSD now, uh, it uses it has a privilege to open the the interface, but as soon as it's open the interface, it gets rid of that privilege. So that if TCP dump is, you know, a buffer overflow happens or something uh, because of a specifically crafted packet, it doesn't have any capabilities anymore to do anything. <clears throat> or they also have this uh, a daemon called Casper, which basically provides an API to allow applications to do things like DNSSEC type lookups and stuff without actually having to contain that code or that capability. Interestingly enough, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 shipped last week, and one of their hall hallmark features of the new release is Docker 1.0. <laughs> I guess 1.0 is patched, but it shows you how something can yeah, well, gain traction really I, I fast. Thought, yeah, but I, I thought like 1.0 was would have been like new from this week, so it's interesting to see that they already had that. Well, uh, they were they were kind the of interesting they timed thing their with, releases. Yeah, I guess the interesting thing with uh, Red Hat there is that. You know, Red Hat 7 will be stuck with Docker 1.0 from now forever. And it doesn't seem like Docker's quite done, ready to that point that yeah. you're going to want to be stuck with it for the five year support cycle of Red Hat 7. You know, in, in full candor. So, well, I guess, uh, Red Hat has that, that new feature, don't they, where they're providing the updated versions of stuff? Remember, we talked about it a couple months ago. Are, are you going to want to use that on your production you server, though? Well, it's. It's something you have to be a subscriber to the Red Hat service or yeah. whatever to get access to it. I don't see, and so it's actually curated in the yeah. same way. Like it won't, it won't be updated. I guess if as long it as won't it's be supported. like leading edge. Yeah, okay. It'll just be, okay. you know, every once a quarter we actually right. grab a stable version yeah. of Docker so yeah. that you're not stuck with a version from five that's, years ago. Uh, by the time Canonical does something similar with their LTS release, and uh, it works. You know, that's FreeBSD has that now as well. We have uh, quarterly snapshots, stable yeah. versions and, of the ports tree, and you know, uh, it's yeah. it's enabled. They get security updates in real time, but that's it. And, and it lets you get a lot more mileage, like out of the 1204 release of Ubuntu and things like that. So I like it. But I look at it and I think, I mean, in full candor, I really like where the Docker project is going, but I still don't think it's there in terms of full-on production. I think it's there in terms of like somebody like me who has an internal network and has some Linux boxes and I want to host applications for our own workflow internally. I think it's there for that. I don't think it's there for public-facing stuff. And I feel like the 1.0 moniker came because... Red Hat wanted to ship it, and they weren't going to ship something that didn't have 1.0, and it came yeah. from all the investors who have been dumping money into Docker and trying to make it a well, commercial that's the product. Thing that's kind of made Docker fishy to me is the yeah. fact that there's like this startup and these conferences right. and all this stuff behind it, right. and it's like, yeah, Docker I thought Con this was supposed and, to be yeah. an open source project, yeah. but it seems to just be a corporate. Well, one. they see it. I think they see it as a way to solve all of the things wrong with Linux, right? So, uh, you know. This, you know, uh, web developers want to be able to have a totally isolated environment on their MacBook Pro, and they want to be able to build up a website, and then they want to be able to just upload that image to get to, to the Docker uh, hub, and then pull it down on the on on a machine. And they seem to be missing the fact that web apps usually depend on an entire stack, and well, they don't you want that stack to be frozen. But well, that's kind of, the thing. That's, the thing is, they want it to be frozen because then they know it's the it's one easy, they developed yeah. on. Yeah. But that just seems to me like a recipe for using old versions of stuff for a long time. This is where I think maybe some of the long-term ramifications of Docker might strike people the most. Is because it's exactly what you just said. Is people people are using Docker right now because it's a snapshot in time and it doesn't change, but that could be riddled with security problems. So they've got to have a good way to keep that up to date. And one of the things Docker will do that's interesting is it does have the capability of sort of operating sort of like in a delta mode where. It'll it'll create its own environment, but it'll only create the it'll only add the files and libraries and paths that have are missing from the host system. So you can do it that way too. So that way, if you know certain things you need it's are like on the host light system, deduplication kind of thing. Yeah, but then that can run into problems too. So not everybody wants to do yeah. it that way. And yeah, it's an interesting technology, but it's it's still very early. And something that's deployed in production like this takes a lot more than just you know the eighteen months that Docker's had. But yeah, like I think the first edition of Jails was under development for more than two years before it started getting used, and then you know a lot's yeah. happened over the last ten years since then. I, I think too, part of it is like um, the web hosting space. You know, the the open stacks out. I don't know. This just seems like people really want to have a solution for this problem, and Docker kind of came around at the right time. Right, and I guess the the misconception is that people are thinking it's a solution for a different problem than it actually right. is. It's a solution for creating an environment 
to host a web app. Mm-hmm. It's not a solution for security. Whereas jails were built from the outset to be a, a, a solution for that instead. And I think some of the stuff that they need to make Docker secure like that is beyond their control. I think it. I think it's in the hands of the kernel team and and system. Well, yeah, basically, guys. it would require changing the Linux kernel. Like yeah. that's how the FreeBSD jails work. Is right. the kernel uh, basically provides all these facilities? Yeah. And so you can't couldn't do that without the kernel. And you know they're doing it now, but they're just kind of getting all that pushed into the kernel would be hard. Yeah. And on top of it, it would make it hard to make it a commercial product after the fact. You know, if all the stuff to make it work is in the kernel, then everybody can do it. Anybody can do yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, and I think Docker is aware of that, and I think that's why they're trying to get ahead right now. Is they want to own that space before somebody else comes along and just takes advantage of the underlying infrastructure stuff. And that's why they're building on that whole Docker Hub aspect of it, and the Docker Con is to sort of create an industry. They want to make a container standard that people develop and deploy applications for Linux on. And then when when it's time for you know XYZ company to go get XYZ company's commercial product, they just pull down the Docker image of it from Docker Hub. And that's how they want to deploy software for Linux. As basically as uh, a hybrid of an application and an appliance. Mm -hmm. But it's an application in a box. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you just run it in that box and it doesn't depend on your host OS. It has everything of its own. But really my concern there is that it's it's designed to be a recipe for using a fixed version of a library. Right? It kind of, you know, it has its, each container has its own set of private dependencies, which means that, you know, they're not going it, to. They basically become appliances, and we know how often appliances get yeah. all their software yeah. updated properly. That's the problem. So we'll see. It's yep. it's something that administrators are going to have to. It's the onus is going to be on them to keep those systems secure and current, and make it all work. So I don't know. Uh, PCBSD or yeah, PCBSD's PBI system is a lot different nowadays than it was. Uh, to most people's understanding, it'll be interesting. Uh, uh, at uh, Southeast Linux Fest, Ken Moore, right. his brother, one of Chris's brothers, is giving a presentation on how the new PBI system works. Happening probably like as people are watching this episode of TechSnap, actually. Oh, yeah. I told q 5 sys to try to get an interview with him. Yeah, you should. That'd be good. That'd be good. Yeah. And uh, is he also the guy working on the desktop environment? Yes. I mentioned that as well because, uh, you know, that's something even Linux people will be interested in. It's like, <laughs> even the Linux guys a care about that. Yeah. 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 Uh, all right. Well, so while we're talking about uh, PCBSD, we're talking about the community, we're talking about conventions, probably a good time to mention our sponsor this week, IX Systems. Go over to ixsystems.com slash techsnap. Check out some of their awesome rigs powered by Intel Xeon processors, ixsystems.com slash techsnap. And uh, talk about a company that loves to engage with the community on their What's New page right now. They've got a mm-hmm. Texas Linux Fest 2014 recap from the past weekend. Drew went down there, and Josh, yep. awesome, good guys. I've met both yep. of them. Uh, and uh, they got some uh, highlights. They got some pictures from uh, different talks, including Drew's talk, the graphical ZFS management tool. What? There's graphical tools for ZFS? In PCBSD? Yeah, there's all awesome. Oh, jeez. Awesome. I got to check that out. I didn't know that. Yes. The most, I mean, for me, graphical tools for, for ZFS are like FreeNAS. <laughs> That's kind of yeah, it. So, so FreeNAS has the web interface, but PCBSD has a huge uh, oh. uh, GUI uh, in QT. It's really fancy. Now, uh, who might be behind PCBSD and behind things like FreeNAS? Oh, wait, that's right. That's IX Systems, ixsystems.com slash techsnap. Part of the community, part of the people creating the software you depend on, part of the people involved with the very technology that makes our world go. And you can have it all from one vendor right here over at ixsystems.com, the people that make the software, the people that work with the hardware vendors, and that white glove customer service. It yep. Out of... I mean, all of the years that I've been doing IT, nobody has had the combo that IX Systems has. This, it's yep. I, I honestly, it, it's like it, it's taken. It, I feel like it's taken time for the industry to get to a point where a company like IX Systems could rock it so hard, and it's almost foolish not to take advantage of that. Trust me, as somebody who has been doing this since the '90s, I have never seen a company like IX Systems come along that can offer the hardware and software expertise and the partnerships, be involved with the community, be passionate about what they're doing, and have a clear vision of the future and then manage to somehow wrap that all around with good customer service, actual reliable support, burn-in testing, and verifiable product reviews right on their website. I I mean, maybe the first couple of items, sure, like experts and people who work on the projects, maybe, but then to bring it all together with the business folks, with the distribution and and the partnerships, 
I mean, iX Systems is like the world has been waiting for them. iXSystems.com slash TechSnap. Yep. Check out that ultimate guide to buying a new server for open source. 11 key traits you must demand from your provider. If you're having a little trouble convincing somebody that some of those other older hardware companies that don't get it aren't the way to go anymore and you need to show them a way to go, well, iX Systems has a white paper you can download that they had somebody create for them. Well, that's exactly the point. Like, I've never, I, I saw this on IRC the other day in the previous G channel, but I'd never seen someone be excited that they convinced their company <laughs> to use a certain supplier. Yeah. Uh, but so just actually literally overjoyed that they managed to convince their, their company to use iX systems for the hardware because they knew the hardware was just going to work right. on FreeBSD and it was just going to be beautiful. And they would get whatever they needed and then it would all work and they wouldn't be stuck with some HP server that was evil. <laughs> well, you know, we were just talking about Red Hat uh, enterprise support, and uh, I came from the bad old days where I'd call up uh, a customer support. It starts with a D, uh, and, and it kind of sounds mm -hmm. like hell, and you call them up, and uh, it was this. Oh, you need to talk to Red Hat. Okay. Hello, Red Hat. I'm having... Oh, I, I need... Okay, I need to talk to my hardware. Okay, yeah, no, I talked to Red Hat, and they said the problem with the tape drive is... Oh, oh, because... It, hello, hello, Red Hat. Well, I just talked to my... I mean, it was like that... All day long, mm -hmm. back and forth, passing the buck, passing the buck. IX Systems brings, brings it all together. Plus, they've got the expertise to help you avoid having those kind of problems in the first place. IXSystems.com slash TechSnap. And a huge thank you. Huge. So huge. I'm not even saying huge. I'm saying huge. And a huge thank you to IX Systems. Go visit IXSystems.com slash TechSnap. That lets them know that you appreciate them supporting the TechSnap program. Okay, Alan, we should move on. There's more things in this world like generalized, secure hash algorithms, right? Yes. Uh, so this one was a post I came across uh, by Ted Unangst, who's uh, one of the lead developers at the Libre SSL project. Okay. Uh, and also designed OpenBSD's secure signing infrastructure, Signify. Oh, okay. Uh, for doing package signing and, and signing of the releases of the OS and everything. And lots and lots of other stuff. We had a great interview with him on BSD Now a couple months ago. Okay. Uh, but he posted a little thought experiment he did on his blog. <laughs> <clears throat> so he kind of asked the questions. How would you design an uncrackable password hashing algorithm? Right? Can it and be done? So he, uh, well, he has He's one proposed solution that might work. Okay. So he started about thinking, well, let's just consider a simple scheme. What if we did the MD5 of the password, and then we check the very first bit, and if it's a 1, we do an MD5 again, and if it's not, then we do an SHA1. And we do that until the total number of passes we've done is 10,000. Oh, okay. So now, if someone spent a million dollars making an MD5 cracking supercomputer, <laughs> it wouldn't work. They would only be able to get every, you know, half of the password. So they'd also have to spend another more than a million dollars to build an SHA-1 cracking machine. Right. And then with the two of them, they might be able to, by going iterating through, be able to get to the end and, and know what to do. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> so it's like, but you know, if they can afford one, one million dollar thing, they can probably afford two. <laughs> so what if we add more hashes, you know, like sure, SHA-256, right. SHA-512, <laughs> ripe MD, Whirlpool, and so on. It's like, well, if they can afford a million dollars, they can probably afford $20 million. So what we need are a lot more hashes. Wow. Uh, so he looked at the code for, uh, SHA-256 and 512. And was like, hmm, I see there's some like magic numbers in here and, and stuff where it you know, mixes up the numbers. And it's like, hmm, what if we, instead of rolling the number by five bits here, we did seven or nine or 11 or more? Mm. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, so then he proposes this system called GSHA512, which is very similar to SHA512, but with slight variations in each of the constants. So say you use GSHA512 number 42, where you've, you know, rolled the constants by 42. Or, you know, GSHA512 number 98765. Or, you know, 65874309, et cetera, et cetera, right? <laughs> so all of a sudden you have two to the power of 512 different variants yeah. of your hashing algorithm. Yeah. Uh, so now, instead of having to spend a few million on a specialized SHA-512 cracking hardware, the attacker, say the NSA, right. would need two to the power of 512 different specialized cracking chips. That just gets a little crazy. 
Right. Well, that's the point. Yep. Uh, so the results. Uh, it's safe to say you've defeated custom silicon. You can't just build an ASIC or an FPGA that's going to uh, an ASIC that's going to solve this because you would need, you know. <laughs> nobody has a fab that can trace out millions of distinct custom circuits per second. Right. In order to get anywhere near two to the power of five twelve, which is just a number that's so big you can't think about it. Yeah. Um, FPGAs are probably finished too because uh, y- assuming you don't melt it trying to reprogram it <laughs> to be, you know, basically an FPGA is a chip that can be reprogrammed to be different types of ASICs. Uh, and so, yeah, you'd have to reprogram it between each iteration of the hash. So you'd have to be reprogramming it so many times a second it just wouldn't work. Uh, GPUs would be a little bit more difficult. Uh, he's never tried it, but his gut reaction to the idea is that you couldn't get the different hashing algorithm programming code into the GPU fast enough, right? Because obviously the GPU can't hold all five, two to the power of 512 different bits of the code, right? So you'd have to you know, generate the code to crack this iteration of the password, send it to the GPU, have the GPU do the work, and, and get the result, and then reprogram it again. And again, right? you basically have to, instead of reprogramming it, you'd just be sending it the code to run, but the bandwidth isn't there to be able to send it enough code oh, to right. crack the different iterations. Right. Uh, so now attackers with a lot of CPUs could still crack the password. But you know, CPUs are very expensive. Unless you know you have malware and you're using, you know, a couple of million machines. But even then, you know, you're talking about a lot of CPU time. Uh, so what if someone could fab their own very special, very cheap CPU, something with like 100,000 cores, Ooh. but only has a couple of very simple instructions? Just print it out. And, you know, instead of having you know, 16 megabytes of cache, it has, you know, like just enough kilobytes of cache to store the hashing algorithm. Just what you need, yeah. Yeah. Uh, now you may be in trouble. Uh, the transistor count of the GSSA algorithm is quite low, uh, but you need a special high-speed general purpose kind of transistor circuit, right? Because it's the algorithm changes all the time, so you can't just build it for the one particular algorithm or whatever. Uh, so it says the S-crypt uh, paper that Colin Percival wrote for his hashing algorithm notes that CPUs could be cheaper than RAM hmm. if you stripped out all the extra functionality that CPUs have nowadays. But in practice, it's hard to calculate the trade-offs. So what S-Crypt does is use a lot of RAM instead of a lot of CPU because while the NSA can build you know, special FPGAs that be really fast at running a, a hashing algorithm like SHA-512 to crack it, they can't buy you know, enough RAM. The market so, just can't support it? Yeah. They, they, yeah. yeah. Uh, you, know, you can't optimize RAM. Right. right, you can you can you can you know custom build the circuit to be very good at doing this one operation over and over again. Yeah, yeah. But you know, a, a megabyte of RAM is still a megabyte of RAM. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so the the idea with the S script algorithm is you make it use a lot of RAM so that cracking them in bulk would require so much RAM that the NSA couldn't do it. And it's also the algorithm that uh, things like Litecoin use specifically because yes, they're trying but to. Yes, Litecoin broke it on purpose. They limit the amount of memory Scrip uses to one megabyte. Ah, well, I was going to say is I think wasn't their goal to avoid GPU mining and 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 ASICs yes. and things like that. Yeah. Uh, but by using such a small amount of RAM, it might be possible for it to be accelerated anyway. Ah, yeah, okay. So basically, they read about they read the Scrip paper. Yeah. And like, oh, <laughs> this protects us from ASICs right. and stuff. So let's use that, and then they changed it such that it doesn't actually. They, they broke like, some of the protections that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, go figure, right? So, uh, but he says uh, this part isn't very practical. Uh, the idea is that a cracker would look uh, that the cracker you would build would look less like an SHA-512 cracker, capable of performing one hash over and over, but more like a general CPU capable of performing all the different hashing algorithms that they would generate for this, requiring an attacker to be adaptive in the way they bring their costs. In uh, yeah, so basically the cracker would have to be able to be flexible enough to do all these different algorithms. And that would make it so expensive that it would be close to how expensive it is for the regular people to calculate the hash right. in the first place. Yeah. Hmm. I find this kind of work fascinating because it's like one of these things where uh, I think we've all kind of wondered about this kind of stuff, but I was never going to sit down and do this. 
Yeah, well, I just I had never thought of of using separate hash. Like uh, PHK had proposed, you know, using a hash that is, you know, three or four of the hashing algorithms put together. It's like yeah, you know, yeah. do the SHA five twelve crypt and then yeah. throw it through bcrypt. Right. And it's like that way, you know, somebody can't brute force. Which is if if something happens where they find a flaw in SHA two fifty six or bcrypt, your password has still got the other one for protection. Mm-hmm. But in this one, you would just be using different algorithms to make it really hard for somebody to, to crack it. Well, Although if they're salted, you're kind of changing the, al- well, not the algorithm, but the input. But Yeah. Yeah, so this changes the algorithm every time. Or, uh, yeah, so the interesting one will be doing this where you come up with some way of deciding how to, so each iteration uses a different one of the algorithms. Right, so instead of just offsetting it for this one hash, we would offset it as the parts of the hash. Could be interesting. Anyway, so there's an example implementation of this uh, that he's posted up the code for. Yeah, it's uh, very small and neat. Uh, and it says, uh, "Don't use these functions for anything except password hashing, uh, because you know they're only written for that. So don't try to use them for anything else because they haven't been designed with those things in mind." And that's you know one of the biggest things about. Um, uh, Uh, cryptographic primitives is that people use them for things they weren't meant for and then wonder why they don't work. It's <laughs> like, you know, the, SHA-512 isn't a weak hash. It's just not good for passwords because it was designed to be fast. That's why we have SHA-512 crypt, which is designed to slow it down to make it good for passwords. Right. Make anyway, it slow, make says, it take time. It's like, in fact, don't use them at all. That's much better advice. <laughs> It's like, this is just a thought experiment. It's not meant to be used, but all if somebody right. uh, likes the idea and could run with it, that'd be interesting. That's fair enough. Uh, it kind of reminds me, we talked about that one from uh, New York University or whatever, where they had um, did the sharing secret thing to try to make it hard to crack individual passwords. You'd have to know multiple passwords in order to decrypt the database. Uh, this is slightly different, but uh, definitely interesting research. Absolutely. And it, it definitely seems like this is something he did in his spare time just because yeah. he was like, that would be interesting. He was curious. He was curious yeah. about it. It had been <clears throat> probably floating around the back of his head. Mostly I, I'm, I'm scared of how quickly he did it. I'm sure he did it very quickly. And it's like, wow, so much smarter than me. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, is he an android? Um, and uh, speaking of FPGAs, we'll have another story about those and how Intel's trying to cope with the demand in the roundup. So that'll yep. be coming up later in the show. All right, Alan, well, why don't I just take a minute right here and thank our next sponsor, and that is the great folks over at DigitalOcean. Go to DigitalOcean.com and use the promo code SNAPJUNE. Just a couple of weeks left to get a couple of days, really, to get uh, a great deal over DigitalOcean, a $10 credit when you use the promo code SNAPJUNE. Now, what is DigitalOcean? I'll tell you, my friends. DigitalOcean is a simple an intuitive cloud hosting provider dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way to spin up your own cloud server. I have gotten messages from folks that have been able to spin up a cloud server in about 40 seconds or so. In fact, somebody is claiming 37 seconds. But on average, users can create a cloud server in about 55 seconds, and pricing plans start at only $5 per month. That'll get you 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, and one blazing fast CPU, plus a terabyte of transfer locked right in. You know exactly what you're going to get. You know exactly what you're paying for. And DigitalOcean has data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, and Amsterdam. And I'm showing it to you right now because I think it's the best thing about DigitalOcean. I love it. I love it. I love it. Man, their, inter- their interface for their control panel is intuitive. So straightforward. And the best part is this power users can replicate it on a larger scale with their straightforward API. Go over to DigitalOcean.com. Use the promo code SNAPJUNE when you check out. You could be just like our buddy Squiggly. Squiggly wrote into the TechSnap program and says, Dudes, long-time listener of just about everything Jupiter Broadcasting produced. In fact, he's been listening since before we called it Jupiter Broadcasting, and he just wanted to let us know that he used the TechSnap DigitalOcean promo code. That's the one that's uh, SNAPJUNE. And he created a host in the U.S. so he could tunnel his traffic over Sox 5, I mean Sox 5 over SSH, in order to buy a region-restricted game at Gamefly. And then he was able to download and pull it right back at his house. Boom! Because when you own your own server, you can set up your own services, your VPN, 
Maybe it's BitTorrent Sync. Maybe it's own cloud. Maybe it's Nginx. Maybe it's GitLab. What is it that you need to do? Throw it on an SSD powered droplet over on DigitalOcean and see how damn fast it is. And by the way, they have tier one bandwidth providers, SSD hard drives, 55 second provisioning, tier one bandwidth, amazing hardware, simple control panel, KVM virtualization, and private networking. That's right. You can do private networking between droplets. So say in the New York data center, you want to have a couple of backend, like a database server and maybe a file server, and then one public facing web server. DigitalOcean's got you covered. You can have those backend servers on a private network. Doesn't it count against your uh, transfer at all? Just right there. Perfect. Doesn't have to go over the internet. Keeps it nice and secure. And they have that HTML5 console and simple API. DigitalOcean.com. Use the promo code SNAPJUNE to get that $10 credit. Try out the $5 rig that I've been using for months for two months for free when you get that $10 credit. Snap June when you check out. Hey, let's represent for TechSnap. It's the last couple of days, really, of June. Why don't we yep. represent? Let's show, let's show the support for the TechSnap program. Snap June when you check out over at DigitalOcean.com. And a really big thanks to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the TechSnap program. Love my D.O. droplet. In fact, I am chatting right now with the chat room through my DigitalOcean droplet. I threw up the Quasal IRC server up there on Rekai's recommendation, and it has been I've awesome. I've switched to that when I switched to my new machine, and I've been pretty happy with Quasal. Yeah, it's got a few wigglies, but you know what I really, really like is just how smooth that whole Quasal client server setup is because I just have it running up on my DigitalOcean droplet, and I'm, I've got like an instance here, an instance here, and an instance up in my office and back at the house. They're all in sync. It's magic. Well, that, that was the big one for me was, you know, Traditionally, the way I checked on IRC when I was on the road was to VNC into my computer. And oh, that's yeah. It's just clunky. painfully slow. Yeah, it's clunky. Very good, sir. Well, why don't, uh, why don't we talk about this story from MSN News about who owns your email account? What's this about, Alan? Yes. Uh, so this was apparently someone who works at MSN has their email account at Yahoo. <laughs> I like this, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so the user had their Yahoo email account terminated by Yahoo for a violation of their terms of service. Uh-oh. Uh, apparently, the violation was he was uh, flaming another user in the comments of a Yahoo News article or something. So they just banned his whole user account? Yeah. Uh, and because, yeah, because at Yahoo, you know, just like at Google and, Google? and uh, Microsoft, yeah. your account is for everything, not just you don't have an email you, account I, and separate and a forum account or whatever. It's I, all one account. This has bitten me on Google when they accidentally shut down my account one day. Yeah. Well, they didn't. it wasn't an accident. They were, your account was being targeted by Chinese hackers, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, I guess that was what it was, wasn't it? <laughs> I forgot that I forgot that it's Chinese hackers. Yeah, yeah that's but true. Still, yeah, when <laughs> yeah. your account gets frozen, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the user had his Yahoo account terminated, and uh, apparently because he was trolling somebody in the the comments on a news story. Uh, apparently they did send him a warning, but it went to his Gmail that he doesn't check or something. It's like, well, that's your configure anyway. Uh, but since that email was part of his overall Yahoo account, it was terminated. Mm. Uh, and he was talking about, you know, what recourse did he have? And it's like, well, it's Yahoo service. They can decide not to give you anything. Right. Uh, Eric Goldman, who's a law professor at Santa Clara, uh, Santa Clara University in the States there, says a cloud service can lock out your assets. Uh, they may still be your assets for the matter of legal ownership, but if you can't access them, what good is that? Yeah, what does it matter? <laughs> it doesn't matter that you own it if you can't get to it. Right. right? It kind of comes down to, you know, possession is nine-tenths of the law. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Microsoft and Google have similar terms of service, although Google says, quote, if we discontinue a service uh, where reasonably possible, we will give you reasonable advance notice uh, and a chance to get information out of that service. Although the way that's worded, it sounds more like they mean when they kill off something like Google Reader, not so much the other yeah, one. Yeah. But there is the Google data download thing where you can download all your data from a Google account, right? Or everything that is, everything about you that Google knows, you can download as an archive. Right. Uh, and so if they did terminate your account, you might be able to still get all your old email out of it or whatever. But it, even that doesn't really solve the problem of people are emailing me at my Gmail account and it doesn't exist anymore. Right. Uh, and that's why if it's... Uh, at all possible, the best thing to do is have your own domain. I was going to say you own it. Yeah. Uh, and then you can still use Gmail, right? You can still actually host it as a Gmail, right? With uh, Google apps for your domain or whatever. Well, you could, yeah. But and, and in that case, you know, even if you're using Gmail or Outlook.com or whatever uh, to host the email, 
if your Gmail account gets terminated, you can move your hosting to somewhere else and your email address right. doesn't change. Right. I will admit my shame. When you email Chris at JupiterBroadcasting.com, that goes to a Google account. It goes to a Google Business Apps account. But if right. uh, at but some if point- if Google were to kill yes, it off, exactly. because you own the domain, you can move it to somewhere else. Which I will do eventually. will stick with you forever. I, I you know, feel like I, I still will. have the email address from my first yeah. company yeah. that I started over 12 years ago now. Right. Uh, and I still have it because I still get email there that I want to get. This is a huge problem in like uh, for people who create domains uh, or people who sign up for services and then that they lose access to that service and they go to reset access and it's going to an old free account that they no longer have access to for whatever reason. Yeah. It's, well, that, that happened to me, right? I used to have a, a mail.com vanity email like at techie.com or something. Nice. And, um, you know, at some point I was like, well, I don't use that anymore. Right. Or, I hadn't logged into it for a while and they suspended it and gave the account away or something. Yeah. And then I lost access to my DynDNS.org account right. and I couldn't control the host names that some applications were using to connect to me or something like that and all that stuff. Dude, I was using AOL back in the day when like there was well, like, I guess the other one had yes, that happened with AOL. A lot of people, a lot of people had uh, accounts from the ISP. Yeah, exactly. Like my email address used to be 98736 at ICANN.net or yeah, something like that. Yeah, and, my, Internet Canada. and like, you know, Comcast.net was <clears throat> like my, a lot got, of my family. And they got bought and, it, and yeah. they changed email address to be at Primus.ca. Or just changed ISPs. Yeah, where people change ISPs. And then there was, exactly. And that's why, you know, I never started using my mountain cable address. And if I had, then I would have lost it when they switched over to Shaw. And now Shaw's been, uh, in my area, has been bought by Rogers. So it would have changed again. They're like, sorry, you can't keep your old email address. Yeah. It's actually not uh, even that hard to do. It does take some setup. I wouldn't expect average users to do it, but anybody who's technically savvy, really just get a domain, and even if you just have it forward to a free email provider, it gives yeah. you an insurance policy. Yeah, m almost every domain registrar has email forwarding as a service or even just email hosting of their own. Mm -hmm. And then later yeah. on, when you finally get a bug up your butt about something, you can go throw up your own server somewhere and just point it to exactly. that. Exactly. Which I'll eventually uh, do. <laughs> and is, uh, there's also the option to host your own email, right? With yeah. a hosting account, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. Their web hosting companies provide email hosting. Yeah. Or you can get a VPS, like a digital ocean, right? It's $5 sure. a month. Isn't that bad to host your email? No. Although you have to admit it yourself, yeah. but there are tools for that or a dedicated server or whatever. Uh, but specifically in the cases of you doing it yourself, as we've talked about before, you shouldn't do it at home because your IP will be blacklisted and just not. It's m almost 100% guaranteed to be against your terms of service from your ISP as yeah. well. Yeah, we got an email uh, uh, later in the show about a guy who's fighting his ISP right now about that same kind of thing. Yeah, but uh, if you do host your own email well, on a VPS or something, most likely you probably don't have like four VPSs to do the backup mail servers and so on. <laughs> right. Uh, you can get a service from DNS Made Easy. Uh, they're a uh, uh, DNS and email company that I've been using for like 10 years. Uh, they have a backup email service where basically nice. you, you, your server is the mail server, but you list their servers as the backup MX right. servers. And then if your server's ever down, even if you're just rebooting it to upgrade something or if it goes down or whatever, um, they will spool the mail up to, uh, I think, 10,000 messages a day or a, in a gigabyte of spool or something That's like that. That's plenty for me. extra for That's, more. Yeah. yeah. And then when your mail server comes back up, they'll deliver the mail. Nice. So they basically provide you that 14-day window of, you know, if your server hard drive dies and it takes you three or four days to fix it, they're holding all that email. And when you bring it back up, your email comes in. Or if you just change the hosting and point the email, you know, it's like, oh, my server died. It's going to take me a while to fix it. I'm going to point my MX record to Gmail and all that mail will come out of the queue and go up in your Gmail and you'll be able to read your email right away. Right. I and, like that. Uh, the backup service, the minimal one is like twelve ninety five a year. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Backup email services uh, from DNS Made Easy. Boy, these guys would be a great sponsor, really, because I've always, I think people are always looking for this kind of stuff. Twelve ninety five yeah. per domain. Per domain. Per year. And, you know. That's nothing. That is nothing. Is like, it's Five dollars a month for the Do droplet, and you know. Yeah, and then you own it. You fully uh, control the stack. You yeah. have full authorization, security, and you know exactly what the backup is, and you are not going to ever lose access to it unless you don't yeah. pay the bills. Plus, you know, <laughs> a vanity domain just makes it easier, right? You know, you have it looks better too, especially name dot com or whatever. And like, if you're looking for a job too, I'm, I, I will I will be absolutely honest. When I saw resumes that had at AOL or at Hotmail on them. 
I tried not to let it influence my opinion of that person, but it might have a little bit. Yeah. Well, like even we get that uh, with scaling. When people sign up for a demo of our video streaming, mm. if they're if they don't have their own domain, we're like, how serious could this person possibly be about video streaming? Right. It's like, it, you know, if if they can't spend the the ten dollars a year to have a domain name, then they're not that they hardcore the into their, a month for video streaming. Their online presence is not a priority to them. Essentially, exactly. Yeah, and stuff like that. But also, um. You know, it's an advice they give us in in college uh, for in a resume writing class. Oh, really? <laughs> like, make sure on your resume that your email address isn't, you know, I love big butts at hotmail dot com or something, right? <laughs> it should your email address should probably just be your name, not some some handle or or pseudonym or something, right? Right. If if your email address isn't your name, then that's pretty lame. Well, why we're giving out um, free uh, plugs to people who should be sponsoring our show to keep us on the air. I also will mention Hover.com, owned by uh, Two Cows, same folks who own Ting. I wish they were sponsors too because they make exactly what we're talking about crazy easy. And uh, they'll even take care of the, the hosting white label aspect for you as well for $5. Um, and if you go there, somehow let them know that the TechSnap show sent you so that way they feel compelled to sponsor us. Because yep. I you know, I went over there and I bought the Jupiter Broadcasting domain for like 20 years through them. Because, you know, <laughs> Two Cows has been around for a while. They know what the hell they're doing. They I make it limit easy. Is 10, but yeah. <laughs> no, no. It, it, was like, it was like 20 years. It was like really crazy. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't know exactly why. I must change the rules. <laughs> I'm sure I can change the rules because, you know, who wouldn't want to take more of your money now, right? Right. Uh, but they have like, it's like click, click to forward your email. Yeah, it's good. The Jupiter Broadcasting Domain, let's see, uh, t- is good till 2024. So there you go. Not quite. Cool. But yeah, it's a good time. It's good. That's good. That's a good length. That's yeah, a good that's enough 10 length. 10 years, like yeah, I said. That's good enough length. Years. Yeah, it's good enough. It wasn't 20. It was 10. It's good enough. 10 is a long time. Yeah, exactly. And if I go in here, so I'm in my account right now, and uh, I could just very easily uh, set up email forwarding for white label forwarding right here from the hover control panel. This is free. They're not, they should be paying me, but they're not. <laughs> so go over there, you guys, use DNS made easy, use hover, use DO or host it yourself, and, and set this stuff up. It's just time to do it for privacy, but also that way. Well, that's the other thing. You know, it's much easier to. To feel comfortable that the NSA isn't reading your email when it's not at Gmail. Well, yeah. I mean, they have to at least come to you to get access to it. But also, like we were just talking about, for posterity purposes, when you move on down the road, I mean, even if you decide, say, five years down the road to sunset that email address, at that point, you could just forward it to some freebie account. So you're still at least getting really important stuff. So that one time on the off chance, something comes up, you can log into that Gmail box that you decided to forward everything to to, and do a search. So it's just a great long-term strategy. Well, yeah, plus, you know, even if uh, you're worried about, you know, spam accumulating over years or whatever, is you can do different names at yourdomain.com, right? And just rotate it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It can be as simple as my email address is 2014 at alanjude.com. Yeah. And in 2015, I will change it. Yeah. And eventually, after a couple of years, I retire the old one, so I stop getting spam. <laughs> Not a bad way to go, to be something. honest. Really, actually, yeah. that's kind of a great way to go. Or, or even just, you know, I have one domain that I won't mention what the domain is, but Hey-o. that I use to sign up for stuff. And I use a different email address for every single service. Yeah. So it's like site name at this email address.com. That's nice if you can pull that off. That's a good. Way right. To go. And that way it's you set know. up so that if I ever get a bunch of spam, mm-hmm. I know Who how, did where they got the address from. You know, it might not be them that's sending the spam, but it's like, oh, it seems like this service might have been compromised because I'm getting a lot of random Russian spam f- to that address now. Well, Alan, while we are talking about how awesome Two Cows is and about Hover, it's probably a good spot to stop right here and mention Ting.com. That's right. Go to techsnap.ting.com because it's mobile that makes sense. Go liberate yourself from your mobile service provider. Go over to techsnap.ting.com to take $25 off your first device if you've got a device and you're going to bring it over to the Ting network. Guess what? $25 in Ting credit. That's right. And one of the things that I particularly love about the Ting Network is the awesomeness of their dashboard. Now, Alan, you know, I'm sure, because you've been on the TechSnap program a couple of times, that Ting is absolutely mobile. It makes sense. And it's only pay for what you use. It's a flat $6 a month. But Alan, did you know that Ting has one of the most awesome dashboards out there? I don't know of any other cellular provider that comes anywhere close to matching the Ting dashboard. It lets you check out your current usage, which is great when you're only paying for what you use. You can manage multiple devices under a single account using their dashboard, see exactly the minutes, the messages, the megabyte usage of each. Easily understand your bill, where it's at per device. Set up 
flags and alerts if you're worried about going over a certain level and then manage this all either through the web page or through their awesome Android or iOS app. You can set up individual profiles. And I like to go in there and say, all right, well, today, forward my calls to this number. Or today, if I don't answer the phone, send it here. Click, click, done. It's really a smooth system. And I really appreciate now that we have multiple devices, it lets me kind of just get a little idea of where we're at. And I can see that Rekai never uses the phone, ever, when I'm over <laughs> when I'm over on the Ting dashboard. It's a really nice service. And as a longtime Ting customer now, it's one of the things I really appreciate about Ting. But they're just making the service better, too. I, you know, if you want to move over to Ting, if you're ready to get out of a contract, if you want to own your device, if you don't want to ever have to worry about an early termination fee again but you're still currently in that contract and you just can't bring yourself to break it, well, Ting is offering a remind me when my contract is up service. Check out the Ting blog for more information on this, ting.com slash blog. This is a cool idea. So go here right now while you're thinking about it. Go to the Ting blog and set the reminder for when your contract is up because it's one of those things that'll probably slip your mind when it actually happens. So if you go here, set the reminder and Ting will send you a nice little gentle email saying, hey, brah, your contract's up. Come save money. Come pay a flat $6 for what you use. We'll just take your minutes. We'll just take your me me messages. We're just going to take your megabytes. And we're just going to add them all up. Whatever buggy you follow to, that's what you pay over at ting.com, techsnap.ting.com. Yeah. And one last little note, and I think this is a really big deal. They just added support for the iPad, for the iPad 4 and iPad mini, I believe. And you're like, oh, cool, iPad. That's not a phone. Why is that interesting? Because iPads these days are almost totally worthless without a data connection. And if you get an iPad with a 3G connection, you're going to be paying $30, $40 a month to have that connection activated for the times when you go out about with your iPad. That's ridiculous. That's so dumb. Such a waste of money. But now that Ting has iPad support, you can have a data connection available on your iPad and only pay for when you actually use the data on your iPad. It's the flat $6 plus whatever the man's got to charge and your usage. This makes these types of tablet devices so much more useful because now you can get an iPad that has GPS built in. It's got the modem built in so you can get data when you're on the go. And using Ting, you're only going to pay for what you use. TechSnap.Ting.com. And a really, really big thank you to Ting for sponsoring the TechSnap program. You guys, go over there, try out the savings calculator, and stop paying these monopolies. Stop helping them abuse their customers. And go yep. help Ting change up the industry. TechSnap.Ting.com. Speaking of cleaning up the industry, Alan, episode 42, BSD Now, cleaning up my mind. That's Which right. That? Episode 42 of BSD Now. What was it cleaning up your mind about? Um, about uh, running a BSD shell provider with uh, yeah. special guest Bryce. Yes. Uh, although I want to get... Uh, <laughs> we, we, we got the email. So uh, in about a month, we're going to interview... Brian Drury, who on top of doing all the crazy stuff with Package NG and the bug tracker, like a hundred other things, he also happens to work for one of the remaining real IRC shell providers oh. that was my, one of my competitors yeah. uh, back when I used to run one 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a great interview. Well, yeah. uh, it just got posted while we were doing the show, episode 42 of BSD Now, Devious Methods. Guys, go check it out. Alan and Chris, another great episode from the team and a little PF Sense news in there, which I know is... Uh, uh, oh, and some ZFS news. Jeez, yep. I tell you, if you're a free, if you're a TechSnap fan, you got to go listen to BSD now because there's some good stuff in there. And I'm looking at the tutorial right now too. And yeah, uh, what you were mentioning about uh, monopolies on top of Comcast trying to buy Time Warner and then AT and T trying to buy uh, Directv, Sprint and T-Mobile are hoping uh, to merge as well. Yes. Yeah. Yep. In fact, now that one will be interesting to see how that affects Ting. They have a so blog post on that right now for people who are curious. So if okay. you go to the Ting blog, they do have. So a, I guess the question is, will it mean Ting's network gets bigger and better, that's or will what, it? That's what they think. They they they've looked at the situation and they're figuring like, well, the MVNO thing makes a lot of money sense for our, for Sprint, and it probably seems like the kind of thing that uh, uh, T-Mobile would want to continue on too. But it actually looks like Sprint would be the parent company. So that makes sense. Yeah, they have a whole blog post about it. They talk. <clears> they address it better than I could. Because, uh, you know, I mean, but that's kind of the cool thing is they know people who use their the service care. Is who, normally, we're like anti-merger, but in this case, it's like, hmm, it would make a ting This better. might be the one, yeah. this Out of all of them, this might be the one, especially because Verizon and AT&T are such a couple of bastards that they could really mm -hmm. be used to take down a peg or two. And so if the two underdogs have to come but together... Again, it, it's like, maybe it'd be better if Ting bought Sprint. Oh, seriously. <laughs> yeah, I know, for real. We'll give them a couple of years, maybe they can. Yeah, and then, uh, or... 
you know, or just broke off and were like, we don't need to rely on Sprint anymore. We are our own network. But we that's, are powered that's by impossible. Powered you know, by Wi-Fi. Years of them build building yeah. towers or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a pretty locked down market now too. Uh, Alan, is there anything else we want to cover in the news segment before we get out of here? Nope. All right. Well, then that brings uh, the news to a close, which means it's time for the Tech Snap feedback. Thanks for sending your emails to techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com or popping that contact link at the top of the Jupiter Broadcasting website, or even better, starting a thread in our brand new subreddit just launched it today, TechSnap. Wait, links.techsnap.tv or techsnap.reddit.com. Alan, our first email comes from, I want to say Nico. I'm probably getting that wrong, but I'm going to give it my best. Uh, he says, hi, guys. Small IT team in an outpatient medical facility. We have about 75 users between two sites and about a dozen people that have laptops to work on from home or while they're on the road. We're a Windows shop. Our domain controllers are Windows Server 2008 R2, and our desktops are all Windows Pro 7. 32 and 64 bit mixed. Anyways, we're finally at the point where we want to take disk security seriously. Our team has always been more about support of terrible medical apps, and we're starting to learn the proper ways of doing Windows sysadmin tasks. So I've been checking out some TechNet articles, and he links us to a few that he's looked at. And I'm wondering if you have any extra tips or advice before we get started. If not, success and or horror stories that you can maybe share with me. Thanks for the great podcast. You guys help me stay curious. So, Alan, any tips before they go all hog on disk encryption? I don't know if uh, how much domain... I haven't done Windows domain stuff for a couple of years now. So I don't... Um, back when I did, there was only like the file, like folder encryption, not mm. the full disk. So I don't know. Can you mandate full disk encryption from the domain controller with like a group policy? Yeah, yeah. I think the other thing okay. too, maybe to consider at the domain po- at the domain level is to make. How does that work? Like I, I know that you can do it in Windows, but when you enable disk encryption while there's files on the disks, what does it have to do? like? Does it just take a bunch of hours to copy every file to the disk encrypted Gosh, and then delete that's the original? A good or question. What? I don't think I've actually ever really turned it on. I mean, I know you can. I don't know if I've ever actually done it. I don't know what that process looks like. I always have done it at the time of deployment of the machine. Now that I think about it, uh, and you know what? Right, which makes sense. Like, uh, but it was it came up in the IRC room the other day uh, for FreeBSD. Somebody wanted to convert an existing system. It was like you can't. <laughs> you can. I mean, like I I've turned on BitLocker and it does just run for a really long time. Uh, so I don't. I guess, yeah, it just uses some free space and then I don't know how it does it in the file, but. Hmm. I've yeah, always done it. If I've it's always supposed done it. to be block level, and and yeah. I guess it's not like the BitLocker. I guess is probably still tied into NTFS, yes. whereas yes. like block level encryption that we use in FreeBSD, it doesn't know what file system we're running on top, I guess, or even I don't if know. you are running a file system on top. I don't, BitLocker, and so it just deals with each block, and so you can't. It's it's all or nothing basically. So what I would say is, you know, the nice thing about the way Windows does it with a domain is you can make sure that the domain administrators always have keys to unencrypt yeah. the drive. Because Yeah, so basically, yeah, the regular problem with disk encryption is if the user loses their key, you can't get the files off the machine. Or, you, you know, the with, user uh, leaves and you and you disable the user account or you delete the user yeah. account. That can yeah, be a major cluster. In Windows, you can set up uh, recovery agents. It's yes. like these three administrators are empowered to decrypt stuff. So every time something's encrypted, is encrypted to all the recovery agents and then the user. Uh, and that way, any of those people can can decrypt the files. And that's how it works with uh, the folder encryption, right? If you just use specific folder encryption, right, if you only want to encrypt certain files or whatever, then again, with group policy, you set the recovery agents and it's like, this is the list of people that all your files will be encrypted so they and you can read it. So that if you lose your password, they can decrypt the files for you again. Yeah. Or restore your access. And I would say too, deploy it in stages. Do not do, because it kind of sounds like they're going to turn it on for everybody. Don't do that. Turn it on for a test group we'll of definitely people. Definitely test for sure, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, like, all right. Really, for something like this, you should probably have a test lab. Yeah. A completely isolated network with a server and a bunch of client machines and, you know, fill them up with crap and then enable it and, and see, you know, what it does. And Yeah. Because the, one of the things you don't want is somebody in a hotel or something boots up their laptop, VPNs in, gets the new group policy, and the laptop starts converting to encrypted disks, and then you can't shut it off while it's right. doing it or something like that, right. and the battery runs out, and right. you break the laptop. Right, yeah. Yeah, this is definitely one of those things where you want to measure twice and cut once when it comes to this particular type yep. of deployment. 
Uh, viewer Chris writes in. He says, "Hello, hosts. Uh, my work has a uh, my work has a distribution list set up for support at Chris's company dot com, uh, which sends uh, writes to those who get mail and can send from the list. So, here's his question: I'm subscribed to too many tech mailing lists. He's got like the FreeBSD Arm, FreeBSD Questions, Free Switch, Tar Snap, etc." So I know these mails are archived and available online, but the lists go under the requirement that I must subscribe to the list. Then I can get us. Uh, then I I'll get a letter each time someone writes that list. Can something mm-hmm. l- like Mailman be made to only receive email from an archive, and and archive it on a server of ours that we can then host internally and make available internally? We don't want users to subscribe to our list because they'll get email not meant for them, and it will just confuse them. If not, do you have any suggestions on what we could do? So he wants to essentially create a local archive of the, of the mailing list, right? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, the first thing is you can partly solve your problem with the digest feature, right? If you on the like the FreeBSD mailing list, one of the options is to get a digest where you'll get one email a day with everything that happened that day on the mailing list mm-hmm. instead of getting every email in real time. Obvious disadvantage is you don't see the email when they come when it gets sent. You see it at the end of the day when you get all the email. But it's a good option for certain lists where you don't want to get every yeah. email. Most lists offer that. And actually, most lists also offer a silent mode where you're subscribed to the list so you can send the mail, but you don't receive any mail. But I guess he wants to share with a team of people. He says they're using Office right. 365. He tried to make mailbox at support and have it all go to that and then have people access the mailbox. But that didn't go over well since some had different archival ideas for the mailing list individually. People want to archive it differently. Yeah, uh, I don't know. All I know is that at FreeBSD, there's a directory where you can, it's a mailbox and you can access each individual message or whatever. I mean, the only way I could really see doing it is setting up your own internal mailing list, right? And have the emails go to that. Yeah, all incoming email yeah. would go into the list. And yeah, and then they could just archive it however they want. That's, yeah, I don't know. Uh, if somebody comes up with a really good solution for mailing lists, I would like to hear it too because yeah. I'm on a lot more mailing lists since I joined the FreeBSD project. Yeah, there's you can get when and you start working. I, on I had to join like two more just the other day because <laughs> I started looking at um, the, working with the guys that are doing the 64-bit Linux emulation for FreeBSD, uh, so that you can run 64-bit yeah. binaries. Yeah, uh, and it's mostly working, but you know I managed to crash it, so I had to do a bunch of kernel traces and stuff. And send yeah. them that, so I had to join the emulation mailing list. Yeah, I, uh, I, I mean, this is part of the reason why mailing lists. I mean, this is one of the downsides to mailing lists. To be honest, like they're they're great communication method, and they're still really uh, widely used. But uh, this is especially like I've been in I've been in an IT department where there's a dozen of us, and maybe like six of us need this, a security mailing list. Like for example, uh, my work required that when we did have Red Hat servers, I was subscribed to the Red Hat mailing list. Like that was part of the requirement of the gerb. Well, everybody else on the gerb also had to be able to subscribe to that, and so we were all getting individually spammed with the same message over and over again. And yep. uh, maybe the audience has a recommendation for viewer Chris out there. Maybe they could let us know. Uh, you can send it. Uh, go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com, click the contact link, and choose TechSnap, or go to links.techsnap.tv. Yeah, or start a, a thread over on the Reddit, and we could have a whole discussion about yeah. different ways and yeah. pros and cons. There's probably a few. And, yeah, yeah. It'd be nice to solve exactly. this for both of us. So that, that's why more uh, a full discussion might make more sense. So it's a good example of when to use Reddit. Yes. So techsnap.reddit.com, links.techsnap.tv. Noah writes in, dear Alan and Chris, he says, I want to thank you for all the work you guys put in. Uh, to the show. He also wants to thank you, Alan, for introducing him to BSD because he always thought it was just a bloated version of the Mac. <laughs> oh, wow! <laughs> it's kind of backwards, buddy. Uh, all right, so he says, uh, I come from a very, very large German company that thinks that Windows is the only OS. Heil Gates! Sorry, that's been programmed into me, he says. Anyways, I know that it takes, uh, it takes for a Windows system to run uh, in an office. However, I don't have the slightest idea of how all Un- an all Unix office would actually work. For example, in a Windows setting, you would have a domain controller with Active Directory that would contain all of the names, groups, and settings for the people under said domain. Next would be a few other ser- services, like maybe email, printer, file, etc. Finally, you would have the Windows clients, and in that perfect world, you would deny access to everything but work-related items as it was configured in Active Directory. Would all of a unit would an all Unix office follow a similar pattern? I know it's a loaded question. Yeah. Would an all Unix office be easier to admin? Is this is this <laughs> he says or is this poo poo one word or two? <laughs> Thanks in advance. No. Right. So uh, yes, you can do this with all Unix. There's a couple different ways. Uh, you have to remember that Windows 
was mostly designed based on the way Unix already did it and then just kind of diverged over time. Uh, but specifically as far as um, having the same users work on every machine or kind of single sign-on type stuff, uh, there are two different systems you can use in Unix. The first is NIS, also known as YP or Yellow Pages. And this basically is a, a system where you have a master server somewhere, like your domain controller, that has a list of all the users and groups and passwords and everything. Uh, and every other machine uses those. So in addition to their you know, local password file, which is, you know, like in Windows, those are your local accounts. Uh, it would have access to the password file from the NIS server, which are your, your domain accounts. And it allows, you know, the same login to work on multiple servers. We actually use that at Scale Engine uh, so that when you have an account with us, you can log into a couple of our different storage servers. And then we, there's a file that maps. It's like, hey, this user is allowed to log in these two servers, and this user is only allowed to log in this one server, and so on. Uh, and the other option is LDAP, which is what uh, Active Directory is actually based on. So LDAP uh, is a directory service that has all kinds of information about settings and stuff. Uh, and you can use that. And so it's just a plug-in to the authentication system in Unix, and then now people can SSH or right. log into the machine, and, maybe that's, and it provides LDAP accounts. That might be a key differentiator to underscore, is a lot of times on a Linux and Unix box, the authentication system is pluggable. Uh, and you can change what it authenticates against, whereas Windows it's fairly or fixed. Or you can even make it authenticate against multiple. Yeah. Try LDAP. If right. the user isn't in LDAP, look in the local files. Right. And that way you can have, you know, people can log into the domain or they can log in locally. And or if you have two different domains, right. you can be like, try the first one. If the user isn't there, try the second one. If the user isn't there, then try the local files. And like Slaver IQ points <clears> in, <throat> you, could, you can take that LDAP combo add in a little chef puppet and cups, and now you've got a centralized printing system and a centralized yeah, configuration you know, management system. Yeah, and with cups, you can do your printer sharing. You know, Unix has been better at file sharing than Windows for how long, right? You can use <laughs> NFS or you can even use Samba, uh, whatever way you want to do it. Uh, and yeah, when you use NFS with those shared users with LDAP, the files will work like that. You can use NFS uh, ACLs to actually you know, have the same kind of permissions you would have in Windows? I think Windows has done a really good job of making this particular thing really straightforward. Active Directory, group well, policy, mostly, join all the machines, yeah, The done. difference is on Unix, you're talking about a whole bunch of different tools and putting them all together. Right. In Windows, it's all put together for you. Ex nailed it. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly but, how it works. you know, the easiest way to start something like this is you already have all these Windows. Move the file server to FreeNAS. And uh, it, it has support for... Active Directory and, yep. and ACLs, and yep. you set it up, and when you mount that drive on your Windows system, you right-click on a file and go to permissions, it's a, using the Windows permission dialog. Yeah, the client doesn't know. And then you start switching stuff one, one thing at a time, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden there's no Windows left, and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, the interesting story with this one is uh, we started uh, running our company out of our office in my basement uh, this week. Oh, so really? Our, our, our programmer is back from uh, living in, in Scotland for a while. Uh, he took a year off after college and worked for us remotely. Uh, but he's back now, and so he's working in the office. Uh, and so it was his first, uh, Monday was his first day sitting down at a machine, a scale engine desktop machine, which happened to be running PCBSD. Boom. He had never used anything except for Windows. He oh. He never touched Linux or BSD ever before. What did Other he think? He, had a, he has a shell account on our server to do stuff, so he knows yeah. some command line yeah. stuff. But he, yeah. And he sat down at the PCBSD machine and was able to just work and didn't even really notice. He was very surprised at how easy it was, right? Because we use KDE, so he has a start menu like he's used to, yep. and he can pin stuff to it. Yep. It had Firefox, Thunderbird, uh, FileZilla, yep. Skype. All the stuff he's used uh, to use. Komodo Edit yep. and, and uh, Eclipse for the Java stuff. Um, I installed the SVN plugin for Dolphin, so we could right-click, you know, oh, SVN cool. update or whatever. Nice. So it's the same as having Tortoise SVN on Windows. Yeah. Built uh, right into and, the file manager. Yeah, and then it was he was just like... I don't know what's different. That's uh, awesome, he, isn't it? Then he got a pop-up from ZFS because one of his hard drive died. Oh. And he was like, oh, okay. But <laughs> mirrored, so it didn't matter. He was like, yeah, what, are like, oh. what are the chances, though? What are the chances? I built his machine just like two weeks ago. Oh, well, if it's going to die. Old, it's, an, it's an old machine, 
and the hard drives were my two leftover 74 gigabyte <laughs> Raptors. The very first Western Digital Raptor, you know, the 74 gig, 10,000 yeah. RPM. They are loud and noisy. And, and yeah, one of them died. Destined to die is what those things but were. But that's why I mirrored them in the first place. Uh, like, yep, no, good you call. just keep working. None of your files are lost. Don't worry about it. And yeah. so, yes, it runs ZFS. And, you know, he's, he, he, a hard drive failed in the middle of him working and he was just like, okay. Honey continue. Badger don't care. All right, Frederick writes And it's in, like, if you were using a hardware RAID controller, you probably would not have even gotten a pop-up. Right, that is... You wouldn't have known a hardware Yeah, until you rebooted and saw the errors. <clears throat> Frederick has some problems with his ISP. He says he's a huge fan of the show, but he's got a very annoying problem. Recently, he says, my ISP decided to block port 53, and I'm forced to use my ISP's shitty DNS server. The reasoning for this is an influx of DDoS attacks. Is there any way around this? I have a PFSense machine as my router firewall. Right. Okay. So the problem that his ISP was having was too many people were hosting DNS servers with that were being used in those reflection attacks. Uh, so they blocked outbound access on port 53 to stop recursive DNS servers and or basically to stop de- denial of service attacks, but also stops all recursive DNS servers. That's interesting because I know that'll break certain routers. Now most routers will just get use the will forward to the the DNS server specified by DHCP. Uh, but this makes me wonder if even his thing is being screwed up by, like, if he would even be allowed to use, like, Google or uh, OpenDNS. I don't think so. I think he like has to use uh, only their uh, DNS. Uh, so his question was about the uh, PFSense? What he could do. and uh, Well, so in the PFSense, you can configure the address that it forwards to, right? And so with that, you could make it use your ISP or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but your other option is something like DNS crypt dash proxy. Uh, we did a tutorial on this like a uh, week or two ago. Um, on BSD Now. On, on BSD Now. Uh, I guess it was three weeks ago. And this is a thing from uh, OpenDNS, and it does it encrypted. And I think it has the option to work on a different port or that it by well, default works on a different well, port. I mean, why I mean, why can't he just use the PFSense box for his LAN DNS and then just have the PFSense box go out and, and bang on the ISPs? Because it's blocking... Well, like he did, the problem is he doesn't want to use his ISP, right? He wanted the yeah. PFSense normally would go out to the root DNS servers and actually right. resolve the name itself, but it's being blocked. I guess he doesn't quite say what makes them crappy. Is it what they look well, up? Uh, or is it their uh, like, speed? Well, partly it could be that you know they return false results sometimes. Yeah. Like they'll say, "Oh, the domain doesn't exist," so yeah. they send you a friendly page. If or that, then that's because also your PFSense I, box I, too. Like, when I had Bell. Yeah. Sometimes the DNS servers would just be down for yeah. a while, and yeah. you wouldn't be able to go to any websites. Yeah. But again, though, if he's using PFSense for his DNS locally, it'll probably cache 90% of what he's looking for in a week. Yeah, but if you, if, if you, well, no, because the cache times aren't that long, right? Mm. The cache time is like an hour mm. or six hours or uh, 24 hours. Well, that's no good. Well, if you haven't been to the website in 24 hours, it won't yeah. be in the cache anymore. He should, I think, if nothing else, though, he should set up DNS forwarding on the PFSense box to start there. To I at think least that's do the local. Default. Probably, think, if it's not. I, I don't think, like, yeah, I don't, I think it's <clears throat> set by that by default. So, yeah, you can, mm. he can play with that. No. But, uh, if you're blocked and you have no other option, you really might want to consider uh, DNS crypt. DNS crypt as a way to get around the firewall. Charum's also suggesting possibly a VPN on the PFSense box and then having. Yeah, a- you could VPN out to somewhere where you could then make DNS requests. But yeah. a VPN is going to in- add more latency to your DNS requests. Yeah. And the whole the the point of caching it in the first place is that you want as little latency on your DNS as possible to right. keep it fast. Right. All right, uh, Barbara Papa, I think is how you say the name, is wrote in, and uh, he or she has a question about why not using SSH as a root. Quick question. Why should I never log in as root over SSH? Is the preferred method to use an SSH key and no password to sign in as a normal user and then sudo to the root user when I need to execute something with privileged commands? Thanks, Barbara. Uh, yes, Barbara. that is the best way to do it. There's a couple of different reasons. First of all, if you disable root login over SSH, it is now impossible for anyone to ever log in as root, which is what you want. Because even if, if you set it to keys only or whatever, you could possibly accidentally, uh, during an upgrade or something, disable your setting of keys only, then allow people to start hammering it on with uh, a password or something. And it just, there's, yeah, you should just never, the default in open SSH is not, in, not allow root to log in over SSH. S- Linux changes that default, but anyway. Um, well, some distros do, yeah. Yes, some distros do. But yeah, you should never SSH as root. And you shouldn't, it shouldn't be allowed by your server configuration. It should be blocked. And yes, allowing login 
uh, as a regular user and then sudo or sudo root is the way to do it. And, uh, you know, whether using keys only isn't necessarily a good thing. And if you use keys, your key should be encrypted and require you to enter a password locally to then decrypt the key to use it to log in. Because otherwise, anyone that sits down at your machine can use your key to log into your machine. And that's not what you want either, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, depending on your distro, like uh, I, I think a couple of Linuxes have something like this, but in FreeBSD, in addition, the only users in the wheel group, or GID0, are allowed to use SU to switch to root. Uh, so with that setup, you would have it, uh, so you could restrict which people, even if somebody managed to log into the machine as a regular user, they couldn't use su or sudo, uh, depending on your configuration, uh, to get to root. Only certain people could. Uh, and, you know, the way mine are set up, you have to log in as me using, like, my SSH key or whatever. And then when you want to switch to root, you need root's password. Right? And that way, you have to know a key and a password in order to get in. Or two different passwords or whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very good. All right. So, Dave. I think Dave's a concerned Canadian. He writes and he says, hey, guys, I love all the shows. I have a quick message that I wanted to share with you. There's a new law passing in Canada targeting mostly small business, and it's going to take effect July 1st, 2014. It's an anti-spam law that will force businesses to ask permission before they send any kind of mass mailing. The maximum amount per violation for an individual is $1 million, and the and for a business, it's $10 million. Uh, He says, here's some examples of how things are going to look starting July 1st, and he also includes a link to a FAQ. And the main page about the law, if people are interested. Have you heard anything about this, Alan? Basically, it's uh, codifying the opt-in rule, right? You, I can't send you an email unless you've positively identified that, yes, I would like to get an email. Right? It's like you have to sign up to get the mail. You, I can't just start sending you mail because I want to. That makes sense. So this is just putting a financial sting to it. It doesn't yeah. sound like it's that bad then. Right. It's just a lot of small businesses... Don't even know, know, probably. uh, Yeah, a lot of people, like even real estate agents or whatever, don't know uh, how they're supposed to do email and And would that accidentally spam? And I guess that could that apply to companies like outside of Canada, like JB. Like, how could Uh, I how could I be expected to follow that? Not that I would spam. I I don't know the rules about outside of Canada. Seems like that same cookie law that just you know. Oh, that one that's been going on in Europe and causing silly pop-ups yeah, all the time. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that one's way worse than this because this is actually sounds kind of nice in a way. But that that, cause that yeah, cookie law is super annoying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thanks, Dave, for sending that in. It's interesting. I hadn't heard about it. But yes, and if, uh, I even really need to go read that back. Well, he he yes, includes three separate up. links for folks if they're yeah. curious about it, and we'll have that in the show notes. In fact, if you go to Jupiter Broadcasting, I guess what? i got a pro tip for you. Go to jupiterbroadcasting.com. Click on episode 167. Then guess what? If you scroll down a little bit, we got links to download RSS feeds and links to everything we talked about, including Dave's email with those links in there. You can find all of it over jupiterbroadcasting.com. Look for TechSnap167. Hey, Alan, guess what? That's all our email. We just blew through it. Like we, we made great, that's like great time on our email with a lot of really great questions. We'd love to get your questions. So go over to Jupiter Broadcasting, click the contact link, choose TechSnap from the drop down, and send in your systems, network, administration, hardware, security question, whatever it is we'd like to answer. It. Storage? Sure. Yeah, we'll take it. Boom. Why not? Routing? Yeah. Well, sure. Why not? We'll take it. Just send it all in or start a thread over at links.techsnap.tv. But Alan, with the email all done, that means it's time for the TechSnap Roundup. Welcome to the TechSnap Roundup. Yeah, that's what that crazy music means. Now, the Roundup for stories that just didn't quite fit at the top of the show, but we still want to talk about them. Maybe give you some links to read on your own after the show. And some of these links came from our awesome subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. And Alan, I just, I don't know what to make of this first story. Hackers claim to have leaked 1.2 million origin account passwords, but EA is like, no, they didn't. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So, yeah, the group claims, uh, I think so far they only released the the usernames or the email addresses, but not the passwords yet or something. I'm not sure. Uh, And then when I read the headline, it said, Electronic Arts finds no evidence of the attack. I was like, oh, well, that's just, it's like, you don't say we can't prove the attack happened. It's like we haven't yet proven that the attack didn't happen, right? Yeah. Uh, but then reading further, they're like, EA is like, no, absolutely not. This did not happen. Yeah, These accounts they listed are not origin accounts. Yeah, they're really adamant about it. So, well, if you look at the list and it's like, well, we 
take a sample of lists, try these, none of these users actually exist in origin, well, then maybe it isn't an origin list. Yeah. And, you know, the same group. It'll be they, interesting to see. It, uh, EA will have huge egg on their face if it turns out it, they were huge, origin accounts. Huge, huge, Yeah. Well, okay, but here's why I... And, I he- and so when they're, for the spokesperson to be so absolutely sure seems... Legit. You know, like maybe... And apparently the same group that uh, is claiming they'll release these 1.2 million accounts also has 1.2 million Facebook accounts. Or maybe they just leaked the long, wrong list by accident. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, is they, they've they also claimed the same thing about Facebook. So yeah. so either they leaked the wrong list, and the list that we're currently looking at is Facebook and not Origin. Um, right. More importantly, is I noticed in the story they were claiming that the passwords are not encrypted. Uh that could allow Origin to say they know for sure because if the if Origin uh, doesn't hash the passwords like they should, then they it wouldn't be possible for somebody to have all the plain text passwords. I, I like uh, Nexua says but, no, it's not the customer list; it's the employee list. Sure. <laughs> I don't think uh, they have that many employees. But, so if Oracle or sorry, if Origin is actually storing passwords in plain text, they should be beaten with a stick. Well, yeah, uh, and they will be. And if that happens repeatedly, uh, yes. now for pizza lovers out there, this one cuts. This next one cuts a little deep, a little uh, Domino's ransom, right? Yes. Uh, so hackers are attempting to ransom off the sixty thousand uh, Domino Pizza customer records that they got from France and Belgium. Wow. Uh, so apparently, France and Belgium uh, share the same database server, and the attackers managed to compromise it and steal all six hundred thousand customer records. Uh, and they're demanding thirty thousand euros uh, from. Uh, Domino's Pizza, or they will release all the data. Apparently, the data is said to include the full name, address, phone number, email address, password, delivery instructions, oh. and people's favorite toppings. <laughs> well, I mean, I, uh, the delivery address and note is a little creepy. I'll give them that. Yeah, it's the whole address, your phone number, your email address, everything. Yeah, that's, that's a little bad. It's quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, and then it's possible that that password is in plain text, in which case or, uh, Domino should be ashamed of themselves. Uh, anyway, Domino says that no credit card or financial information was compromised and that they will not be paying the ransom. Well, you know what my question is. Is this a one-off system that this Domino's franchise set up, these series of franchises Possibly set up on their or own, or is it something they use across all Domino's systems? Domino's in the UK, uh, their spokesman, uh, because the website in question was from the UK, Yeah, uh, it was funny because when they were uh, quoting the tweet uh, from the attacker... They put the little SIC thing in there to indicate that the typo was from the quote and they didn't make the typo mm. about the word favorite because it was the American spelling and not the British oh. spelling. Because <laughs> I was like, that looks spelled right. I was like, right, right. In Canada and Britain, we spell it with a U. Fancy. U's make it in fancy. In Australia and everywhere else in the world. Except. So that suggests the hacker might be American or learned American English. Mm. Hey, while we're talking about ransoms, Nokia yes, ended up paying them ransom. Now, this one, uh, the, the, first of all, the fact that this is just coming out in 2014 when it's from uh, yeah. 2007, it's yeah. pretty big. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, this one sounds like a movie. This is pretty amazing. Yeah. I, like, literally, I, I just want to see a movie about this now. So, like, like a, I, completely fictional, but a movie about so this. So, it was a person or a group got a hold of like Symbian encryption keys. Is that what happened? Yeah. So, so back in 2007, uh, somebody contacted Nokia claiming to have the uh, signing keys used to sign the, all the apps and stuff for Symbian OS. And they ransomed it back to Nokia or ransomed out that they wouldn't do anything bad with the keys in exchange for a couple million euros. The exact amount isn't uh, listed, but okay, it's okay. more than a million and it was listed as substantial. I was wondering. So millions of euros. That's a lot. Uh <clears throat> If the keys had been leaked or used by the attacker, Nokia would have had no way to ensure that phones were only accepting updates from Nokia and, uh, yeah. you know, blessed apps or whatever instead of malware, right? right? So it seems that Nokia didn't have a revocation system in place to be able to update what key is trusted. That was an expensive oversight. Yeah. Although kind of the problem with that is if someone steals your keys, they also have the ability to revoke them on you. But also, <laughs> you know, how do you set it up so that if the old key is compromised, how do you distribute what the new key should be? Because you wouldn't, it's like you'd have to create the new key at the same time you created the original key, but somehow keep them separate so they both don't get stolen or something. Yeah. But anyway, uh, so uh, the money was left in a bag in the parking lot of a nearby amusement park in Finland. 
Uh, the blackmailer took the bag. The police were there, like it was like a sting, right? Like in the movies. So the police are there waiting for somebody to come pick up this bag full of money. But the blackmailer managed to grab the bag, and somehow the police lost track of the blackmailer because he was smarter than them, what? and he got away with the money. Unbelievable, but believable, actually. Yeah. The Finnish authorities have had no luck solving the case. So the guy just got away with it. Yeah. So, you know, he set up a, the right series of stuff to dodge the cops trying to follow him in the money. I guess in 2007 they didn't have a GPS tracker or he was smart enough to, you know, he had his own bag and he's, so he took the bag and dumped all the money in his bag and then took off with it or whatever. I feel like I've missed so many opportunities to make millions. there was like no dye pack in the bag or something. We should have gone bad. We should have skipped the whole public podcasting thing. We should have just gone for a life of evil crime and been silly rich. That would have been awesome. Yep. Uh... Yeah, and one of the reasons I'm not silly rich is because I keep buying SSDs, and that's why I love reading these SSD endurance experiments. You can't base your whole data protection strategy off of one series of tests, but maybe you can take some of them in an aggregate. Uh, so Honestly, this, uh, the real, the right approach is that assume they're all going to die and yeah, use exactly. ZFS with lots of redundancy. <laughs> uh, so this is coming from thetechreport.com. Uh, they did an SSD uh, endurance experiment. They started oh, right. with so these guys right. They, they set up the SSDs running, being pounded on, and just leave them running constantly. Yeah, and yeah. reporting results. So we uh, got a, a Corsair, uh, an Intel, and a Samsung Evo, and a Kingston HyperX. They've all been running. They've exceeded their endurance specifications. All of them did successfully writing hundreds of terabytes without issues. But now they've written over a petabyte, and only a few, about half of the SSDs remain. Uh, of course, the drives failed at different points and in different ways uh, before reaching the one petabyte milestone. Uh, then they did some autopsies of the divi- of the d- drives and, and kind of like dissected when and where they failed. They got lots of nice charts so you can see the drop off uh, in the terabytes written. It's pretty fascinating. It's a five page write up. And uh, they talk about performance. They talk about the petabyte club, so the drives, the SSD drives that made it to a petabyte. They show how the Kingston drive performs versus the Intel drives versus the Samsung drives. So if you love this kind of stuff like I do... Well, and they have a great chart here showing like the Intel 335. It has this media wear out indicator. Yeah. And it hit zero before it died. Yeah. So that, that actually means that it was kind of... And you can see the reallocated sector line. It was just coming up. I wish they should have done a two different scales on the graph so that the, the gray line was on a different scale so you could read it because right now it's so small it's hard to read. But. Yeah. Or or maybe the scale's right and, the, and the, it only reallocated like two sectors ever. <laughs> it's a pretty cool uh, experiment. But a link to, to get the actual data would be nice, like to just get like a spreadsheet of the actual numbers. But Huh. And they talk about, they talk about how the drive started behaving erratically after a certain point. This is really fascinating stuff to see this. Yeah, looking at the Kingston HyperX, they have the media wear out indicator and they show that all of a sudden it, the, the decline slowed down a lot and then... It started picking up again as it hit the end, although I don't know if it actually showed zero before it died or if it died and they just ended the graph. They, uh, they wrap it with, uh, only, even though they only tested six drives, the fact that they didn't, it didn't experience a single drive failure until after they'd written 700 terabytes is a testament to the endurance of modern SSDs, they say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they show uh, the Samsung has a, a reserve of blocks uh, to replace the failing ones. Yeah. Uh, and they show how there's an indicator, and then they show that uh, as they went on, they started dipping into it. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that, and the, isn't that the Samsung's uh, wear level indicator hits weared out at 300 terabytes, even though it managed to write. It's written 900 so far and not died. Oh, I just got a Samsung recently, too, so I'm glad I made that right. It sounds like I made a good purchase. Mm-hmm. Uh, cool. So that's a long five-page article if you guys want to read that. And uh, now this is a story we teased. During I guess the, the only real problem with this study is it's all old SSDs, not the new ones. Yeah. But yeah. it would take years of running the new ones. Although the new ones might be able to get to a terabyte faster, faster. because they write so much faster. Yeah. we got to get them all and put them all together, though. Uh, so Intel's doing something pretty crazy. Intel mm-hmm. plans to offer custom Xeons with embedded FPGAs for like really high-end data center customers. Uh, yeah, so like we've talked about, or we've heard about in the past how they make custom chips for like uh, Google and Facebook. And we're like, well, that's probably just a custom screw where they have you know more cash or less cash or something to make the, you know, less cash so they can buy more CPUs for less money or more cash so they can get more performance or whatever. But so an FPGA is a special kind of chip. This, um, there's four kinds of CPUs, right? There's an ASIC, which is a application specific integrated circuit. It's a 
chip designed to do one specific thing and that's it, right? They make them for like Bitcoins, right? It, it does this one operation and nothing else. Uh, an FPGA is something that's it's kind of like an, a reprogrammable ASIC. It's it has a bunch of stuff and it you can it does it works like an ASIC. It does one thing over and over, but you can reprogram what that one thing is. But it can't do everything, right? It can only do certain types of things. And then you have a GPGPU, which is what you have on newer video cards, and that's good at certain types of operations. And then you have your regular CPU. Uh, so what they're talking about here is a Xeon that. Biggest important note on this story is that these are the existing sockets. So this is you could take out the Xeon you have and put in this new one, that and it would make certain jobs faster on the same computer. Yeah, it's using that quick interconnect technology that the Xeons have to do the communication in chip. Right, but but the big thing is that it's not a new socket, and you'll be able to drop this into like existing motherboards that yeah. are out right now. Yeah, uh, they might require a BIOS update, but mm. that's it. Uh, and basically the FPGA would be able to be programmed to, you know, if your server does a lot of one specific thing, you could program that FPGA to do that one thing faster. Mm. And they get that much more performance out of it. Yeah, they, uh, so they, I mean, we're not talking massive scale here. Uh, to give you an example, I think this year Intel did this for a dozen customers already. This is right. really, uh, they don't really, uh, that's really uh, limited. Yeah, they don't really mention how much these chips are going to cost. No, and it sounds like the max they're going to scale it up to is potentially like somewhere in the 40 customer range for next year. But you can see where they're going with this. And it's sort of Intel's response to, you know, a lot of there's a lot of talk about using ARM in the data center for certain things or whatever, right? But this is a great solution. Yeah. Like the same chip with the same socket. Or, that's awesome. That's really yeah, well, cool. Well, just the compatibility there uh, makes this a big win. It's huge. Although. Yeah. If the price is such that only there's only 40 companies that can afford it, then maybe. Well, because you know, because Intel's doing a custom run when they do this, right? Right. So, yeah. But you know, at some point, maybe it'll come to light. Like, uh, we kind of I remember the talk about this like 10 years ago from actually from AMD. This idea that you know, when you have a machine that has like four or eight processor slots. Mm -hmm. You would have one processor that was just really good at doing XML. Right. One processor just really good at Java. Now, the FPGA is not quite that level, but it, you're kind of getting the idea that you might actually be able to get to that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting stuff, Alan. Speaking of uh, not surprising it's gotten to this point, Dogecoin. Mined on top of storage devices, the guy managed to earn six hundred and twenty thousand U.S. dollars doing this. Uh, this was Dogecoin is worth like a cent or something, well, but it's, it's it's based on S script, right? Yes, uh, and so all it requires is memory, and it runs on a CPU, right? So unlike Bitcoin, which you can't make anything running on CPUs, Dogecoin has really low difficulty. I know on Litecoin purpose. is based on script. I'm not sure about Dogecoin, and I think Dogecoin is a fork of Litecoin. I think so. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, so here's how they did it. Uh, here's how they found it, too, which is kind of funny. A pair of researchers at Dell's SecureWorks security division have traced a collection of malware-infected storage devices to a hacker who amassed more than $620,000 worth of the currency, which they say was mined from hijacked machines. Now, they say that this stash, largely created in just two months, may be the largest cryptocurrency hoard ever mined from the computing from, un from unknown victims, that's kind of amazing, but here, here's the best yeah, part. Basically, it sounds like somebody found an exploit for one of the Dell storage appliances. On the Synology then, appliances. Oh, is it Synology? Yeah, according to uh, David... So that's what a lot of people have at home, I suppose. David right? Shear, who spent months just kind of like tracking down vulnerabilities in the Synology boxes. He wasn't actually looking for this particular problem, but in September, uh, another researcher found a hole that they said, you know, this could lead to something like this. It could give people access, and sure enough... Synology users began complaining that their devices were running slowly. One Facebook poster noted that he found a folder on his machine labeled Pwned, <laughs> and uh, sample files shared by online infected users uh, show that uh, it was using CPU miner on the Synology boxes. Of course, Synology yeah. issued a patch like back in February for this, on February 14th, according to the company. And they say they take people's data security very seriously. <laughs> so there's, yeah, there's like three things there. First of all, why do people have their Synology facing the internet? <laughs> So it can get attacked. Yeah. B, why are not people updating their Synology? And C, why was there a hole in the Synology in the first place? I, but I like yeah. to pretend like maybe like the they downloaded malware on their Windows box. It used universal plug and play to open up a port to the Synology. Then they put the malware on. No, I don't know how they did it. It's more likely it just, if you had the malware on your computer, it could just go straight to the Synology. Yeah, maybe. But uh, 
That seems unlikely too. It seems like they scanned the internet, found a bunch of internet facing synologies, and uh, hacked them. And the advantage with uh, Litecoin and Dogecoin is the fact that because a CPU, it works really well on a regular CPU because what it wants is memory. Mm-hmm. So a Synology would like, what's it got, like two gigs of RAM or something? You can, you know, go two, nutty. Four, yeah, I mean, and, and, uh, and uh, because Dogecoin's difficulty level is a lot lower than some of the other cryptocurrencies. Well, yeah, because like a, a, apparently a Dogecoin is worth point zero 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 five nine Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> now, why our Bitcoin ticker thing doesn't convert that into U.S. dollars at some point? I like that sense. we have a Dogecoin ticker in our chat room too. Yes. <laughs> um, so, Alan, you ever you have to understand that when you're a government agency, agency, you're working with contractors, you're trying to do internet stuff, and you just keep getting sidetracked by all this leet speak. Well, guess what? Well, it's more for uh, as far as investigating stuff. If you're going to have agents reading yeah. people's tweets and trying to figure out what the hell they what mean, what are they then, saying? I don't yeah. understand this jive. Yeah. So, uh, who well, did the funniest was I always when it, when I'm looking at these lists of like these, I'm always just astounded by the ones that is like no person I know ever would says that. Use that right. <laughs> so this, uh, so I guess the FBI has a database or a list of leet speak phrases which was released after a Freedom of Information request. Which is kind of funny. Um, well, and, and the worst part is because it's an F, uh, uh, FOIA request, they always release those as badly scanned PDFs on a CD. Yes. Yeah. And like, this their, one's crooked even. This one's even freaking yeah. crooked, which is really annoying. Uh, but that's a good, it's good for, it's, it's nice for a laugh. Because apparently there's an acronym, A-S-S, or ATST, which means at the same time. I've, I've never, never seen that I've used never, by anyone. No. Ever. Never said that. Never seen anybody use that. Also, ATW, at the weekend. You do something on the weekend, not at the weekend. Nobody says ATW. But, but I'm, I'm guessing there's a bunch of high school kids somewhere that speak crookedly and say at the weekend instead of on the weekend. Maybe. Like when they're texting. Not even English. <laughs> that's, that's horrible. That one I can't read, but AUP usually means acceptable use policy, not another something something. <laughs> You know, it's kind of it's when you see, when you get a little peek in there, you just boy, these guys are just lost. <laughs> like I like, you know, there's a bunch of these that you see on like mailing, like right? at your own risk. Uh, yeah. I seem to remember, you know, in my opinion, whatever. I'm but, not a lawyer in real life. Yes, yeah, all this stuff, but you know, yeah. Hey, uh, Alan, some of these don't make any second uh, any chance. What do you? What are we like talking? BBK, boy, better know what? Who talks like BBK? that? BBK, no. boy, better know. N- nobody, no, that's not even a thing. That's not even. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it seems like somebody just got paid based on how many of these they could come up with. Yeah, like hey, uh, hey, that kid, that intern over there, have him write up a few of these that he chats with his friends. Um, why don't we talk about level three buying a uh, Time Warner? Is that who they are? TW? Who's TW? Yep. Is that Time Warner? So TW Telecom used to be part of Time Warner, but uh, it was spun off as a separate business. Okay. So th- level three, pretty big backbone provider here in the U.S. Uh, well, f- all over the globe, actually. $5.68 billion to consolidate with TW Telecom. What do you think Yeah, about so they're this? buying TW Telecom, which is mostly uh, business internet connections. Uh, they're based in Colorado, and uh, they sell a lot of business level internet connections. And level three being a backbone is trying to pick up on that and, and you know, want more market share in that area, especially businesses and, and voice over IP and stuff like that. And it, it basically expands their reach in a bunch of markets, uh, you know, certain areas and stuff. And I but guess mostly it's, it's Time them- Warner and it's offshoots that was put into it all seem to be up for sale. So. This article over the New York Times also mentions about uh, getting into Time Warner's or TW's uh, VoIP business for level three. I yeah. guess they'll be getting into the VoIP business. Yeah. So uh, some headlines headlines were mistakenly saying that this was related to you know the Comcast Time Warner stuff, but TW Telecom was split off and it specifically isn't called Time Warner uh, because it's not part of Time Warner anymore. But they kept the initials TW so that they would still have some recognition that this is still the same company as it was before. Yeah. I see. Okay, that's where my confusion comes from. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, in con- our continuing series of places that I actually shop at and having their credit card breaches, uh, credit card databases breached, PF right. Chang's confirms. So we, we talked about PF Chang's the other week. Yeah. Uh, but basically, they've now admitted they have no idea how the attackers compromised their system. Oh, good. Uh, they're still investigating. Like they haven't given up, but they're they don't know yet. So as a precaution, they have temporarily reverted to using the old-fashioned analog impact. 
on uh, machines. The carbon copy so stuff? The carbon cape copy yeah. thing. They run this thing over your card and it actually makes a print of your the face of your card. The stuff from when I was uh, a kid? <laughs> in, yeah. Like I honestly saw one of those once in my life. Yeah. Uh, at a hardware, like a local hardware store yeah, or something. Yeah, the, the, the last and time... Maybe I, twice on, on TV. I think the last time I saw one was like at out at a campsite where there was no connectivity and they still wanted right. to have like some sort of transaction with cards. And they had... But like even on an airplane, like yeah. ones where they don't have Wi-Fi, right. they use the terminal and right. then they just process them in batch offline the next night. Well, because think about it. Like how do you check to see if a card's declined in that setup? Well, they don't. Basically, they save the card information yeah. and hope it works. You know, they know what seat you were sitting on on the airplane, so they will. Oh, well, I'm talking about PF if, Changs, though. Right. You yeah. could go in with a busted credit card and get a free meal right now. Exactly. Exactly. And if they're not <laughs> actually looking, you could probably just trick them with an expired credit card. Maybe. Right, because you know they well, and I've got machine checking that. Not so they're not even going to look at the card and see if I they should. Expired. I should try this because in my wallet right now, I've got a card that still has a valid expiration date, but they just canceled it and sent mm-hmm. me a new card. But the card itself, still, all the numbers look legit. I should try it. Yep. Not that I ever would, <laughs> but I mean, come on, free pot stickers. But yeah, uh, that's that's the thing is that you know this is this probably opens them up to a lot more fraud than they were going to face. And the other one is they mentioned it working for debit cards. It wouldn't work for debit cards in Canada, although some of our debit cards now have the Visa logo so they can be used as a credit card in places that don't accept debit cards. Uh, but in particular, those ones, it was most, like uh, elsewhere in the world, they will work as a Visa. But in Canada, if the place does debit card processing, they will reject using it as a Visa. They'll decline and say, no, please put this through as a debit card. So I'm, I'm just curious to see how they're going to do offline debit card transactions. Because in Canada, a debit card transaction required a PIN number until we got the um, chip and PIN chip system. Chip and PIN, yeah. Which still uses a, a, a PIN number. Yeah. Uh, so your debit card always required a PIN number, although now we've added the credit card option to let people buy stuff online without having to have a credit card because you know certain people can't get a credit card. Mm. Like people that aren't old enough yet. So if you're... You know, 14 year old, you have a debit card, you can spend your money using your debit card now online. But uh, anyway, um, I'm, I'm reading our next story. Uh, I have a couple of questions about this. The True Crip author claims that forking is impossible. And that- right. So uh, I think it was Michael something. The, one of the guys that was doing the audit of True Crypt sent an email to one of the guys he knows was one of the authors of True Crypt. So this guy knows for- who the authors are? Because I thought they were anonymous. Well, no, they're anonymous, but he knows the guy's email address to be able to send him an email. Okay. Right? Uh, and he sent, so he sends the uh, author of True Crypt this rather long email uh, asking stuff and gets back like a one and a half sentence reply. <laughs> Yeah, basically saying don't fork uh, if, true crypt. If you follow the link, you uh, you can see he sends this really long email, and in back he gets quote, "I am sorry, but I think that uh, what you're asking for here is impossible. I don't feel that forking true crypt would be a good idea. A complete rewrite was something we wanted to do for a long time, and they hadn't done right." He says, "I believe that starting from scratch wouldn't require much more work than actually learning and understanding all the true crypt current code base." And he says. I have no problem with the source code being used as a reference, but he he doesn't want the current code to be forked because apparently he thinks it's really bad. But Does that sound over reasonable at to you? Dot, um, yes and no. You know, every programmer always wants to start their project over from scratch. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, and you know, it depends. But uh, over at Slashdot in the comments, there's lots of talk about you know. If he's under a gag order, he can't say that there's holes in it, but he's like, no, don't fork it. Start over and just use it as a reference. And mm. Make sure you don't copy the exploit or whatever. Yeah, I don't know but if it's But at the same time, though. it's like, you know, people are auditing it, and if they don't find the problem, yeah. then... Yeah, yeah. and yeah. I like uh, the top comment right now on, on Slashdot. Subject is, you keep using that word. It would appear that the intended meaning is impractical. The code is available, and the original project declared itself dead. So forking is but technically possible. Technic- yeah, but... The license might actually prevent that. Mm, but okay. we've talked about before, yeah, if the people want to stay anonymous, how are they going to enforce the license? Right. Um, I just find the whole thing to still be a little weird. There is yep. something more than we're being told here. I just don't know what it is. And you exactly. could go down and a rabbit hole. That's why I'm kind of uh, with the idea of let's not keep Use, using it. Yeah. I mean, if the author's saying don't do it and they've abandoned the project, maybe we should take the hint. And, you know, like even the email when the, the auditor guy sent, it was like, well, we'd have to rewrite this part and this part and this part. And the guy's like, yeah, so yeah. why fork it? Just start over. 
You um, can use this as a reference to save time and stuff. But do you think you'll still feel that way if the audit comes back in a little while? And they I've say, never used TrueCrypt, and I wouldn't. So mm. I like it, but I, I'm not married to it. There's it's useful other... in that it's portable, and yeah. most other things aren't. Yeah. But you know, if I need to encrypt a single archive just to move it between machines, I can use GPT or something. Yeah. Yeah, it's very true. Uh, you know, I wasn't really against the idea of TrueCrypt before, but I've just, you know. If I need it encrypted, it's over here. And if I yeah. don't, it's and, not. And I'm with you. I mean, if the guy is saying don't do it, then don't do it. Yeah. I mean, he's, he could be, there could be more than what he's able to say. And we should be taking the hint, like Alan says. It's just a little, it's it's disappointing. I think yes. it's, Well, it's disappointing. And it's also just, yes, the, there's enough weirdness going on here that we have serious questions. We want, yeah, we want answers. Yeah, well, just out of curiosity, it's like I'm not demanding an answer. It's just like right. it'd be interesting to know what the hell was going on here. Because this, is an, this kind of thing is an important thing to the industry. And and sort of having some answers would help us sort this stuff out in the future. But maybe in time. Maybe more will be revealed in the future. Who knows? All right, Alan. Well, I think that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. Now, Alan and I particularly like it when you join us live. So head over to jblive.tv Thursdays at 1 p.m. Pacific, which is... 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Boom. Of course, you can get that converted to your local time over at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. You can hang out in our chat room. We do extra stuff between segments. You get to help name the show, yell at us as we go, throw some suggestions in our face, and chat along. And uh, you also can ch- catch it on the uh, audio-only stream if you're mobile or sitting at a desk, jblive.info. And last but not least, don't forget TechSnap has RSS feeds available for your weekly consumption. That way you automatically get TechSnap when a new episode is released, which is usually Thursday evenings over at jupiterbroadcasting.com or uh, Friday mornings, depending on your time zone. And uh, don't forget, we have a whole new week of episodes of Tech Talk Today out. Uh, today, I talked about the new Amazon smartphone. And um, mm-hmm. Alan, you know you know how the uh, feds uh, seized uh, dead Dread Pirate Roberts uh, bitcoins from Silk Road? Yes, I, apparently they're auctioning them off. And that they accidentally emailed everyone who's been bidding <laughs> it on the CC instead of BCCing them. So everybody's name and email address that's bidding on these... Uh, what a bunch of freaking amateurs. I know. So I talked about that in Tech Talk today as well as a few other things. It was so unbelievable. So, uh, it'd be interesting to see how much that flood of coins will depress the value of everybody else's coins. Yeah, it's already the market or, price dropped. Well, yeah, because everybody's trying to sell off before this thing comes in and yeah. lowers the price more yeah, and yeah. hence actually lowering the price even more. Yep, it's a funny <laughs> it's, thing. It goes to show you know what the problem with a speculative currency like that is. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that was a that was a point of it, I'm 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 falling some of the Bitcoin coverage in Tech Talk today not not too much but a couple of times a week we'll throw it in there because it's a daily show Monday through Thursday over JupiterBroadcasting.com Tech Talk today go check it out all right well that brings us to the end of this week's episode of Tech Snap don't forget to join us live and be sure to send us your emails go over to JupiterBroadcasting.com click the contact link and choose Tech Snap from the drop down and we'll read your email on a future edition of the Tech Snap program. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for tuning this week's episode of TechSnap. We'll see you right back here next week.